Okay, Julie, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in writing? Sure. So I am the author of Tell Me Three Things, uh, What to Say Next, Hope and Other Punchlines, and the forthcoming Admissions, which was both admission, non-admissions, excuse me, which you, you would think I would know the name of my own book, but you know. <laughs> Um, and that was supposed to come out May 5th, but it's actually now pushed to December 1st um, because of this little thing called a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, messing up the world just a little bit. Um, and how did I get started writing? Well, actually, oddly enough, I started um, as part of a New Year's resolution about, I think it's maybe 15 years ago now or 13 mm -hmm. years ago now. Um, I used to be a lawyer. And I truly, truly hated my life as a lawyer. Um, and on Sunday nights, I used to cry about having to go to work on Monday morning. And one year, all of a sudden, I decided as part of a New Year's resolution that I wanted to quit my job and write a book. And the plan wasn't actually to become a writer. The plan was to quit my job, write a book, and while I was writing the book, figure out what kind of lawyer I actually wanted to be that would actually make me happy um, because I was absolutely miserable doing what I was doing. And I did it. I made the New Year's resolution. And then the next day, or I guess it was probably a few days later when I went back into the office and quit my job and started writing. Um, and I'd say within two weeks, it became immediately clear to me that like, this is what I was supposed to be doing with my life. Um, it was so organic and natural in a way that nothing had ever been for me before. Um, and it felt so good. And then at first, I didn't actually know if I could become a writer. Um, and when I mean, I mean a professional writer and do it professionally. Um, but I got really lucky and very quickly from then on, I got to, I got a two big deal with Random House and actually became a professional writer. Um, I always, when I tell this story, I always feel like I should say, never quit your job to write a book. It's a very stupid thing to do. <laughs> like a really, really stupid thing to do. It turned out to be the best decision I've ever made in my life. Um, but it was not a great idea. I mean, it's, it, I just got ridiculously lucky that it worked out the way it did. Um, and I feel like it's really important for people to realize that you do not have to be published to call yourself a writer. Um, it took me way too long to self-identify as a writer and I wish I had done it years earlier. So before you started writing young adult novels, you wrote a couple adult fiction books, is that right? Yep, yeah. So how did you make that transition? Yeah, I, I forgot to bring up my, um, I have them. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't, I don't know why I didn't show them to you guys. Um, yeah, I have two adult books. The first one is called The Opposite of Love, um, and the second one is called After You. And I wrote a third adult book, which lives in a drawer. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I, I really like to tell that story to teenagers in particular, because I think it's important for people to talk about their failures as much as their successes. Um, because failure is a huge part of being a writer. It's, it's sort of baked into the life, um, and it sucks, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's real. Um, so after I wrote After You, I wrote a third book. It was, I wrote it after my daughter was born, um, and I left her every day with my mother-in-law and, and went to a Starbucks. I was living in London at the time, and um, wrote at that Starbucks all day long and used the terrible bathroom and spent time away from my kid to write this book. And it took two whole years of my life. And when it was done, I handed it to my editor and my editor was like, you know, I think there's something here, um, but it's going to take another year of edits at least to get to a place where it's going to be strong enough. And I thought about it and I realized that the book though was totally, like it was fine. It was a book. Um, it just wasn't the kind of, I felt like even after a year of editing, it would never be the book that you hand to your best friend and say, you have to read this, mm -hmm. which is my goal anytime I write a book, right? Like there's no point in putting out a book that doesn't inspire more readership. Um, and so I made the really difficult decision to put that book away and not try and edit, not try and fix it. Um, and it hurt, like it really, really hurt. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I mean, literally two years of, you know, very important years of my daughter's life and, you know, financial, I mean, it was, it, it, it really blew um, in a million ways. Um, so anyhow, I wrote that book and then um, I was thinking about what else to do and I was writing a little TV, just like sort of dabbling in all sorts of things, started a new adult book, um, 
that I wrote probably a hundred pages of or something, moved from London to New York to LA, um, had a second child. And then the, I, mean, I realized this is a very long way of yeah. <laughs> explaining how I got to why I apologize. But basically what happened was I always felt um, for much of my adult life that I wasn't actually a grown up, that I was kind of pretending to be one on television. You know, I would go during the day and be a grown up and put on my business suit. And then I'd come home and take it off and be like, I fooled them another day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that way for really for much of my um, adult life until I moved from London to New York to LA, had a second kid, owned a home. Um, I, I mean, I was a professional writer at that point. Um, I was on the freaking PTA. I mean, like my life, I was adulting as hard as a human can adult. Um, and it occurred to me that like, oh crap, I'm a grown, am I have to say crap? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my, oh my goodness, um, I'm a grown up. And that realization was horrifying. And I, it made me realize that like, I already knew all the answers, not all of them, obviously, but like the major answers to my life, my life's questions. Like I know my husband, um, I know who my kids are. I know how many kids I'm going to have. I know where I live. There's certain like basic parameters of my life that if they are not set, that means something very wrong has happened now. Um, and I miss being a teenager when like the whole world was wide open. And I didn't know where my life was going to go. Um, and sort of that unexplored territory, the first, you know, first love, first kisses, all that stuff. And so I started writing YA to kind of go back and reopen that feeling of possibility. Um, so I put aside this other adult novel that I was writing, um, which I should probably go back now thinking, I, I don't, it was not bad. I just, was, I just wasn't inspired in the same way I was by this YA, YA idea I had for Tell Me Three Things. Um, and then got to like, you know, be a teenager again. Um, and that's why I love YA. And I still love it actually for exactly that reason. Um, you know, it makes a boring middle-aged mom like me get to sort of re-experience the magic of being young. Definitely. Okay, so I was reading some of the author's notes um, after finishing your novels, and you talk about inspiration from your personal life in some of them. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how your own teenage experiences informed some of your books. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, interestingly, whenever I write a book, there's always some larger life question I'm struggling with. Um, and I think that... Um, I don't always know when I'm writing what that question is. Like there's a sort of thematic element to what I'm doing um, that I don't, that only comes to me later. So for example, what to say next um, is very much about two people who connect at a lunch table. Um, two people who unexpectedly connect opposites. And I was on a panel maybe two, three years after I wrote that book. And I was talking about my husband and I said, you know, I met my husband at a lunch table. And after I met him, I said, you never know who you're going to meet, who's going to change your life, which is a true story. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I wrote a whole book about that. Having, I swear on my life, having never connected it to my own story. Tell Me Three Things is the exception um, in the sense that Tell Me Three Things is very much a combination of two things that actually did happen to me. Um, I did lose my mom at 14. Uh, so it was, you know, a combination of one of the, or if the worst thing that's ever happened to me with one of the better things that ever happened to me. I once received anonymous email like Jesse does and tell me three things. And I sort of put those two things together to write, um, the book. So I feel like that book is the most, um, most grown from my personal experience, but every single book I write has a real personal question that I'm unearthing and often very subconsciously, um, that's, you know, for whatever reason is, you know, driving my writer brain and itching at my narrative soul um, in some way. I, I have a, my second adult book, After You, is about a woman um, who steps into the life of her best friend after her best friend is murdered. Um, and it's all about how well you know the people you love. She sort of starts to unearth all these secrets of her best friend. Um, and it's, it like tackles the question of whether you can truly ever know someone um, and what hides under our, our facades and how sort of lonely it is as a human to never fully understand what's happening in someone else's brain. 
when that book came out, it occurred to me, I wrote that book just as I got married. Um, and even though my husband and I had been together, I think like seven years before we got married. So a very long time. I knew him very well. Um, when he proposed to me, I suddenly had this sort of anxiety about whether I truly knew him. And I started him asking him all these questions like, who was your third grade teacher? And what did you have for lunch yesterday? And tell me everything. Because I felt like there was that barrier. And so after you is, a, is an exploration of that. So I think my personal life falls into all of my books, even though they're not, you know, after you is not a story about someone getting married in any way, shape or form. It's about best friends, but it's the same examination. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you say like, and tell me three things, the move from Chicago to California would relate to you moving to California from like, I think you said it was from New York. Yeah, you know, I, um, I've lived in LA twice, um, this last time for seven years, but I lived here before I moved to, L I've done Boston, New York, LA, London, New York, LA. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess I have moved to LA twice, so maybe that sort of sticks with me. I do think LA is this really um, rich, fascinating place. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the stereotypes about it are 100% true, and I love it anyway. Um, I don't even, actually, I have no idea. Where are you guys? Oh, right now I'm in Kansas City. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are and you guys Chanel and I are in Iowa. Iowa. Okay. I had no, you know, I really had no idea where I was calling. Midwest. <laughs> um, yep. I, so, so tell me three things is said at this high school called Wood Valley High School, which is this mm -hmm. very ritzy, fancy pants LA private school. Um, which provides so much fodder. And in fact, my next book, Admission, is set there also um, because it has, the, so Admission is about um, the college admission scandal. It's a fictional take. Um, and it was sort of really fun to go back to that same school. Um, I think there's just so much material there that that is so, um, I don't know, really, just really interesting. Uh, and it, it provides so much fodder. And so I think that's why I've written a bunch of books set in LA. Though, What to Say Next and Hope and Other Punchlines are both East Coast books. I grew up on the East Coast. Yeah, I also live on the East Coast because that's where my dad lives. My, my parents were divorced, so my mom was here. My dad lives there. And when I was reading, like, Tell Me Three Things, the high school reminded me a lot of my high school. Interesting. Because, um, so in Jupiter, Florida, there's, like, the ridge part, and then there's, like, you know, the farms where like you have to drive in the town to get anything. And like, you can just look in the parking lot and there's like so many high-end cars from all like the kids that live, you know, close to the school and the beach and stuff like that. Yeah, I feel like there, you can tell, and those are the details, right? Like if you're writing yeah. a book, um, if you're gonna, if you were gonna write a book about your high school, mm -hmm. you would drive that parking lot. And either yeah. your character is driving the beat up Honda or the Mercedes, mm -hmm. right? And you would describe the difference and what it feels like to pull up, whether you're in the Mercedes or the, the Honda. Yeah. Like those are exactly the details that make um, a setting like that interesting. I, for what to say next, um, it's very much a New Jersey suburban book, mm -hmm. uh, which in some ways was really fun for me. I grew up in the New York suburbs. And um, if you asked me growing up, I would say it was the most boring place in the world. There was nothing happened there. There was nothing interesting at all. Um, but now looking back, it was sort of fun to like mine that boredom and sort of talk about the itchiness of being a, a high school kid in a town you can't wait to get out of. Um, and so I, I feel like as much as I love writing about Wood Valley, and I'm actually returning it to, to it again in this book I'm writing right now, um, I do think there is something to be said for writing about an, a totally different kind of school that doesn't actually lend itself to that much interesting material. Like, what's interesting about it is how boring and suburban and how it's like every other high school in America, you know? And you wrote um, in your author's note for that one that it was your favorite book. Is that still the case? I, I really, I really love David and What to Say Next. He's one of my favorite characters I've ever written. Um, and so I feel really protective of that book. Mm -hmm. My daughter, who's 10 um, and probably a little too young for my books, has read them all anyway. Um, though she hasn't read Hope and Other Punchlines yet, um, and Tell Me Three Things is her favorite, and so, um, that won some points for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. like maybe it's my favorite now. 
Um, I don't know though. It's sort of like picking your favorite kid. I, I love them all. I love them all differently. And I, I do feel like each book accomplishes something different um, and shows a side of me that a different, the other books don't. And so I appreciate each book for, for what, how it pushed me and whatever way it pushed me. Um, I feel like what to say next. Um, I just loved playing with voice in that book in a way that I hadn't before. Um, and I enjoyed writing it. I don't know. I don't know if it's my favorite though. Hope and other punchlines. Um, I think it's the book I'm most proud of. Um, but it's not my favorite cause it tortured me writing it. It was a miserable experience. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. An admission was just a joy. I mean, it was like just only fun. Um, so it's, each book is different. Yeah. I don't know if I have a favorite. I, I, I feel like maybe that author's note is, is lying now. <laughs> I wondered, yeah, you've written two books or you're in the process of one and a half at least right now. So I wondered if that had changed. Yeah. Um, since each of your books are so different and you talk about different lived experiences and backgrounds from your own, I wondered who do you talk to or what kind of research do you do to make sure you represent them as accurately as possible? Yeah, I, it depends on the book. Um, with What to Say Next, uh, one of the major characters is on the spectrum. Um, and I felt it was really important if I was going to have a character on the spectrum to do it responsibly and respectfully. And so I did a ton of research for that book. Um, and I wanted to make sure the character didn't grow out of the research, but was informed by it. Um, so that book took a ton of research. Hope and Other Punchlines is set um, 15 years after 9-11. And, so, and, and it's about... a a girl who was a baby on 9-11, who's famous for being in a photograph where she's being rescued on her first birthday um, from the Twin Towers. And sort of that experience uh, being in that iconic photograph has um, changed the entire course of her life. And it's, it takes place um, when many years later, she's at a summer camp trying to sort of outrun that history. Um, and that book required a lot of research about 9-11 um, to make sure I accurately portrayed what happened. Um, I mean, I was alive during that time, obviously, um, and remembered a lot of it, but the sort of the visceral feelings, I felt like I really needed to, to dig deeper and look at images and, and do things like that. Um, admission, um, admission came out of my obsession with the college admission scandal. So I was already doing the research anyway. I mean, not that the book required any real research and I'm a lawyer, so the, the law part was, you know, sort of easy for me, but, um, I had already been obsessed. I had already read everything you could possibly read, which is how I knew I needed to write the book. I feel like the rest of my books didn't really require much. I mean, there's always, you know, a question here and there where I'll reach out to somebody or I'll go visit a place. Um, in terms of language for teenagers, that I think might be the thing that's the trickiest uh, because I feel like language is constantly changing. And if I write what teenagers are saying this minute, by the time my book comes out in two years, it's going to sound dated. And it's going to sound like I'm trying too hard. And so there's this weird line between pandering, like I don't want to pander to teens. Um, and I have to figure out what language I think is actually going to last. I do have um, a teenager who lives in New Jersey who just went off to college, I guess a year ago now, she's going to be a sophomore who occasionally I will just send a random text to or email to being like, so when kids make out now, do they call it making out? Do they kiss? What, 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 what are the words you guys use now? <laughs> and I always sound like such an old lady when I send them. And then she'll write back whatever people are saying. And I'll have to sort of sift through her answers to find the ones that sound like a more universal ear. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you, you never want to sound like you're trying super hard. Yeah. You yourself, right? From my experience as a teen, slang differs from what state to state. Like slang in Florida is very different from slang in Kansas and what it's used. Like some of it is universal, but like most of it is different. Yeah, and I think if you're telling a story that's super specific to a place um, and in which you want that language to be part of your story, like if you're telling a story about, I don't know, Florida teens and it's very much informed by the fact that they're in Florida, and you feel necessary to use that particular language, um, I think that totally works. I think you just have to be careful about 
how of the moment you are. Um, yeah. Because publishing takes so long. It literally takes years from when you sit down to write a book for it to come out. Um, and so by the time your book comes out, you don't want it already to be dated. Yeah. I, I also need to, I am also really careful about not too many pop culture references or mm -hmm. fans, things like that. I mean, occasionally I'll throw some in anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if you put too many, it can really date your work. Yeah. Unless, unless you're writing something dated, right? Like if I was going to write a book set in 1977, then I should put all those cultural touchstones to sort of set it there. But if my, yeah. if my idea is to be modern and sort of a little vague about when we're set, um, I think it's better not to have those markers. Though, to be honest, and maybe you have an opinion on this, I'm struggling right now um, with this very big moment in history. Like, we're living through this, these unprecedented times on many fronts, and to sort of ignore them in the writing feels really yeah. weak. Um, but to not ignore them, uh, to actually address them also feels too, like I'm pinning something in place in a way I don't want to necessarily. Yeah, and well, so both of my parents are scientists, and they're currently working on studies on the virus. Like, my mom is doing an antibody study, so, um, right now, because of all, like, the protests, like, it's very important, like, the protest itself, but I think some people sometimes forget that, like, here in Kansas City, people don't really take the virus seriously. Like, people don't wear masks, and it's, like, very frustrating, because you literally have an institute, like, it's in Missouri, but it's, like, 10 minutes from the state line, working to create, um, they got FDA approval, so like the test for antibodies and stuff like that, working on vaccines. I, my dad's working on like a COVID receptor vaccine. And like, it's sometimes the protests that get so close to like the research institute that they have to put it on lockdown, which hinders the process like of work getting done. And um, it's just like, I think there needs to be a more of a like, it's very important and we need to recognize it, but there needs to be a balance of like progress and getting stuff done. Like progress needs to be happening in both directions without hindering each other. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's super tricky because the mm -hmm. issue of racial justice, mm -hmm. I think supersedes the pandemic in terms of like what our country yes. needs to focus on. Um, at the other, on the other hand, I, I'm deeply disappointed in our government's uh, yeah. reaction to the pandemic and how yeah. we have not, I, I, I almost feel like we don't have a functioning government in terms of a system in which we're all working together. Basically, we're trying to solve a collective problem individually mm -hmm. and we need the government to solve the collective problem so we don't have to each make these, these decisions for ourselves because when you leave it to people, they don't wear things like masks when we all should be wearing masks, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's super complicated, but to sort of, bring it back to writing, I think that when yeah. you're looking through these really complicated moments, yeah. I'm going to write a book right now, and I am, I'm writing a book, I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I started it well before the pandemic, well before, um, you know, schools locked down and people were virtual learning. And the book involves kids going to school and living their lives, and they have no concept of COVID that doesn't exist in the world I'm writing. Um, and it becomes a really uncomfortable question of whether in two years, we have no idea what our, what two years from now look like, because we're at a mm -hmm. moment, that if I write a book that doesn't address it at all, is it going to be completely irrelevant to teenagers? Mm -hmm. Is it going to, or is it going to be a comfortable escape from the reality? Or are li our lives going to somewhat go back to normal enough that it may, like, it's, it's, it, these, these are impossible questions because no one can tell the future, but that's yeah. the sort stuff that we novels, novelists sort of constantly are, you know, noodling. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. For me personally, it would be like a nice escape, but I question how admissions for college is going to look like now, mm -hmm. especially like more people I know aren't going to go to state universities because they don't have to pay tuition if it's going to be online. And they're going to start off like at a junior college online because it's cheaper. So I want to see how admissions would look like. Yeah, I mean, I do think it fundamentally um, changes. I mean, I think the landscape is fundamentally changing. I do think mm -hmm. tech is going to invest in, in um, universities and, you know, like a class, at, like say at Harvard, for example, where mm -hmm. there, I don't know what, 500 kids who go into the freshman mm -hmm. class. I think there's going to be a whole virtual element where it's going to be 
thousands of kids, which in some ways is going to change what that degree means. Um, and the cost of the degree. And I think there's going to be this big divide between the people who can afford to go and the people who do it online. Um, I mean, I, I do think the entire landscape of higher education is going to change fundamentally. And I think admission is the only book I've ever written while writing it. I felt like this book needs to come out fast because yeah. it's going to sort of lose, um, not, I don't think it loses its, I actually, I actually don't think it loses its relevancy. I don't think it's, I mean, it's very connected to the actual scandal, but what's interesting about it is not the scandal. It's what's interesting about it is the scandal, what the scandal talks about in terms of privilege. And I think those issues are only going to get more important, not less. Um, I, I think that divide between rich and poor is, is our inequality in our society is only increasing, not decreasing. And so I think the book in some ways becomes more relevant as time goes on and as admission, the admission process changes from COVID. Um, but if people only see it as a college admission scandal book, it sort yes. of makes things a little trickier. Yeah, and I think that divide is even emphasized for things you need to get in the college, like AP exams. They were online this year. I had to take them. Luckily, I nothing didn't cancel out, and I didn't have to retake them. But the divide of people want, luckily at my school, I don't have to pay for them, but paying for them, which because they cost like ninety four dollars, mm -hmm. and there's colleges be like, there's no excuse yet you didn't take them because they were online this year. You should have been had access to them, so it's on you that if you didn't take them, and that's like one deductible of why we don't really want you instead of like this person who yeah. took like ten. And you know what? Not everyone has access at home to the internet, reliable access. You know, these are things that some people take completely for granted, but not every student has. I mean, there are a lot of high school kids out there who don't even have hot meals right now, not to mention yeah. that. Um, and the system is completely skewed to the people with resources. I like pretty much everything else in our society, but I think college admission highlights it in a way that nothing else does, which is why I find it. But it's why I wrote the book, because it's fascinating. I mean, even thinking about like, the students who get to apply early admission to college. Mm -hmm. um, when you apply early admission to a school, you don't know your financial aid package. So a mm -hmm. lot of kids can apply early admission because they need to know their financial aid packages to decide what school they want to go to. Um, and so the early admission process favors wealthier kids. Um, and there's a million examples of that, right? Like SAT tutors, mm -hmm. what you were saying about yeah. the AP exam fee. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, it's endless sort of the ways in which the privilege in our society um, are, are advantaged in the college admissions process. And, in, and what's interesting is I feel like a lot of these privileged people don't actually even see their privilege. They think mm -hmm. that they're the ones who are at disadvantage um, when in fact they're clearly not. Yeah. I, the whole thing is so fascinating to me. And as someone who's probably gonna, what year are you? I'm a, I'm a rising senior. Okay. Oh, so you're going through it soon. Yeah. I've oh. already done college visits and all of mine for this year got canceled. Oh. I did I, some sophomore year, but I didn't get to do my junior year. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, I mean, I, as you know, it's a really complicated time to be yeah. applying to college, especially because um, no one knows, right? Like no one knows what college is going to look like next year. Yeah. And especially ACT and SAT scores wise, like having, like, we had one scheduled, but then as like college board canceled the one in June. So we had to like figure out how to schedule it in like September and, October, and August, but they made us charge for it again. And it's such a pain in the butt. <laughs> I mean, it's already such a stressful thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the college admissions process is unnecessary, unnecessarily stressful and kind and of expensive. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very expensive. Every application costs a lot of money. It's not, I, I, don't, I don't know if it still works the way it worked when I went. It still costs money and stuff. And especially like for ha like I know people will pay like professionals to proofread their college essays. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like edit them. Yep. I mean, it's an entire business. I mean, that's what the college admission scandal is all about, right? Paying mm -hmm. these. Um, college counselors to help your kid have an advantage to get in. I mean, the, obviously the college counselors and the college admission scandal took it to a whole other level beyond editing an essay. Um, mm -hmm. But it's all a continuum of behavior that's sort of not fair, I guess. is mm -hmm. um, And then the question is, as a parent or as a student even, when you're applying, if your parents do have the resources to help you have your essay edited, 
Um, mm -hmm. Do you give up that opportunity or do you take it? Um, and I think it's a real, I think it's all really complicated. Yeah. Like, I think especially, like, because I have family, like, my age that go to school here, and seeing how they, so I think my school tries to, like, because, like, getting the UF and um, FSU is extremely difficult if you're a Florida resident. Mm -hmm. So they push AP classes, so you're either regular or AP, essentially. And here, they don't even let you take AP classes until you're a junior. Oh, wow. So seeing how that, the push up opportunities, even with schools, even different. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's, it's all so complicated. Um, do you want to be a writer? Um, I don't really, I like reading a lot, but I don't, if I were to do writing, it would probably be do like research wise. Cause I, re, I'm really interested in psychology and I want to become a child developmental like psychology. And I want to do like child therapy and stuff like that and music therapy because I've been in like choir for eight years. So that's what I've been really interested in. I think, I feel like they're related writing and child psychology in the sense that um, mm -hmm. anything that examines human motivation um, mm -hmm. and the human brain and sort of why people do the things they do. Um, yeah. You're a child psychiatrist or psychologist or developmental mm -hmm. psychologist working from the, you know, the fixing angle while mm -hmm. the novelist is writing from the story angle, um, mm -hmm. but it's still the exploration of the human condition, right? Like, yeah. why do, how do people tick? Um, yeah. And I feel like people who are interested in those things are usually readers. It's the same, it's the same yeah. thing. And that's why I liked, um, what do you say, Nat? Oh, that, I think that's the title. <laughs> My brain's <laughs> not working. Next? No, you know, it's so funny. I, I, I want to hear what your thought is, but what to say next had a million titles before we landed on what to say next. Yes. And I will confess it is my least favorite title of all of my books. Be and it does make sense in context of the book because mm -hmm. the character never knows what to say next, blah, blah, blah. But it also feels like, you know how a mm -hmm. lot of YA books have just like random phrases for yeah. their titles? Um, yeah. It feels like one of those random phrase titles and it drives mm -hmm. me nuts. So I, what to say next? Go ahead. Whatever you were going to say. Yeah. Um, so I took AP psychology this year and all the, like the accuracies with like it being extremely accurate with like the psychological aspects throughout the book, even like the being like the newest book of the DSM is the DSM-5, but he has like, I think it was four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like accurate. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, they got that right. And so it was like, it was really nice because I could use stuff from that, what I previously learned and like use it throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, to, to go back to Chanel's our earlier question about research, that was something I wanted to make sure I got right. You know, those details are really important because if you get them wrong, it throws the reader out of the book. Yeah. You read what to say next and you were like, what is she talking about? That's not in the DSM five. Yeah. Then you, I would have lost you, right? Like you yeah. wouldn't have, you would have bought into my world and you yeah. would have on me. I do have yeah. a few, I feel like there's one of my books. I can't remember. It's what to say next. I shouldn't confess this, but I'm going to anyway, yeah. where someone emailed me recently that I messed up when someone can get a driver's license in that state. Mm. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's such a stupid detail to get wrong and it messes up the whole story and mm -hmm. i'm like well let's just pretend the laws are different <laughs> and right now like the driving laws have like slightly changed like i know in georgia you don't even have to go to the physical dmv to take the test you can just take it online yeah, yeah. i mean in the age of covid everything is different but in the age of yeah. tell me three things or yeah. whatever my, my books are set there that that doesn't mm -hmm. like the laws are the laws um yeah. So it's always frustrating when, and they, it's, it's pretty much impossible not to get things wrong sometimes, yeah. um, but it hurts when you do. <laughs> you're just like, dang it. No, exactly. You're like, ah, oh, well. Um, yeah. What do you do after you publish a book? Do you just stay off of Goodreads? Do you never read the reviews or um, what, what are those months following the publication of your book look like? Is it a whirlwind with book tours or? It's very book dependent. Um, but with Goodreads in particular, Goodreads is a horrible, horrible place for writers. It's a wonderful place for readers. It is a very unhealthy place for writers. It, there's, <laughs> there are few places as terrifying for a writer as Goodreads. So my general po policy is when a book first comes out, before it comes out to the public, but we have advanced review copies, which sort of go out to, you know, 
super readers and media outlets and stuff like that, you start getting the first round of Goodreads reviews. I read those because I just want to know what the initial reception is to the book. I want to make sure people are liking it. And I want to see what they say. And if there's some, if they're, you know, if they're hating it, I need to know. Um, if, there, if there's a problem with it, I need to know. Like, I just, I, I find that first initial reaction really important. Once I get, like, a sufficient number of reviews where I have a sense of what people think of the book, I don't go back to Goodreads. I'm done. Um, mostly because it's an unhealthy, terrifying place. And it doesn't, it only makes you feel bad, right? Like, I could have literally a thousand five-star reviews and that one two-star that calls me boring or stupid or whatever hurts so much more than the, the pleasure I get out of the a thousand five-star reviews that it's just a no-go for me. Um, in terms of the process of publishing and like the feelings of having a book come out, I think the lead up to a book coming out, like the, the two months before I go a little bananas and I get super anxious. I, it's, it's going to sound really weird. Um, I love writing. I love being a writer. I am living my biggest dreams. I truly love what I do. I hate when a book comes out. <laughs> I just, I, I really, I just do not love the process of transitioning from having a book belong only to me and then having it belong to the readers in the world. Like it feels sort of violating in a weird way. Um, I love touring and I love talking to people and I love, you know, going to bookstores and, and meeting readers and book festivals. I love all of that stuff. Um, but I don't love the feeling of the book getting judged by the world, which, and that's just part of being a writer. And I just, it, I just don't, it's it just not a part that um, particularly fulfills me. I think that there are some writers who live for that moment and I just happen not to be one of them. I'm kind of a big introvert who kind of loves to just be alone with my, my computer. Um, I feel like, so I get really nervous the two months leading up to it. Then the book comes out. Um, and then I'm fine. Like as soon as it's out, like there's this moment, like I wake up the day the book comes out and I'm like, huh, ah, it's done. There's nothing I can do. And it's released to the world. And it's sort of like in some way sending your kid off to college. You hope the world is kind to it. Um, and you, you gave, given it all the support you could. And now it's, it's, it's turn to sort of stand on its own two feet. Um, and then it's fine. Like once it's out and I'm touring and, or not, depending on whether, you know, we're in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> It, uh, then I'm fine and I love the road and it's great, but there's something about those two months leading up that causes real, I don't know, anxiety for me. I have to figure out how to fix that. I don't know how to, I'm six books in now and still, um, I haven't figured it out. Well, that's related to one of my questions. I wondered during the process of writing and then when you come out with a book, how do you practice self-care? Because I mean, you talk about grief so often in your books and I'm sure it brings up memories or experiences of your own. How do you like close your laptop and walk away for the night and try not to go through all those experiences? Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I choose to write about something, there's a reason for it. Right now I was talking earlier about there are these thematic questions. So writing um, doesn't feel traumatic, even when I'm dealing with traumatic things from the past. Maybe, I, first of all, I'm doing it in the form of story, right? I'm not telling my memoir, um, which gives me like a, a necessary distance to make it slightly less painful. Um, but also it's always something I feel like I need to process. Like I'm doing work while I'm doing it. Um, and it, writing is sort of always been the way I process the world and my feelings. And so interestingly, I find writing itself is self-care. The not writing is not. So wh when, I'm, when I finish a book um, and I send it to my editor um, and I'm waiting for the next idea for the next book, because I'm not one of these writers who has a notebook full of 100 ideas. Um, I'm very monogamous with my books. Like I have an idea and then I'm in love with it and that's it. Um, and I, there's this period of time always when I finish a book um, and I'm waiting for the next idea. And that's the hardest for me um, because I, I'm not writing. I'm instead feeling the creative well and I'm watching tons of movies and reading tons of books and going to museums, which sounds delightful in theory. Um, and it is, it's awesome. It's great. It's a nice way to spend the day. It's better than, you know, working in a coal mine. Um, but I feel this itchiness to get back to the page. Uh, and I, I feel, um, I don't have that like flow to help me process my feelings. 
Um, so I feel like the self-care is the writing. It's the, it's when I'm not writing that I need some other form of self-care to, to get through. So I feel like up until maybe last year, I always had this romanticized vision of what an author was doing when they were writing a book. Like they were in a cottage by the sea and they were wearing like a really nice Irish knit sweater or something. <laughs> um, they have a typewriter. So I wondered, what is it actually like to have like a day in the life of an author? Um, well, there's, you know, the day in the life of an author in normal times. And then there's the day in the life of an author in pandemic times. Sure. Um, I will tell you more about the normal times because I think the pandemic times are way less interesting. Um, in normal times, I live a very sort of nine to five job life. Um, and my, I, I mean, I write uh, full time. Um, I, most writers these days actually do not write full time. They usually have a full time job and write on the side. Um, but I'm super lucky that I get to write full time. Um, and the way it works is my kids get up, I send them off to school. I have two elementary school age kids. Um, I exercise and then I walk to work. I have an office about four blocks from my house. It's a writer space. And so it's a room that's filled with writers. Um, I live in LA, so there's a ton of writers here. And we basically just pay for access to this space where we have Wi-Fi and desks and chairs um, and outlets and a clean bathroom, which is key. <laughs> I can't tell you how amazing it is to be able to leave your laptop and use a bathroom. As someone who's written in, co in coffee shops for like 10 years before this place opened, um, it's like the greatest gift that anyone ever gave me was this lovely clean bathroom um, and a refrigerator where I can put my lunch and a coffee machine. Um, and that's pretty much all that's there. Um, there's a few little rooms that are like, some are quieter and some are louder, um, but it's lovely. And it's f amazingly four blocks from my house, which is just like a dream. When it opened, it was sort of like, it manifested it from like my deepest desires. Um, anyhow, it's fantastic. And so I go there every day and I probably am there 10 to five. Um, I'll take a lunch break. Now I'm not really writing from 10 to five. I mess around way too much on the internet. I read way too much news. Um, I look at way too much, you know, social media and Twitter and all that junk. Um, I also have like a huge part, not a huge part, but part of my day is, is spent with the business of being a writer, right? Like, you know, organizing events or responding to emails or um, looking at covers or whatever, you know, comes up that particular day. Um, and then I try and write in blocks during the day. Um, I have freedom on my laptop, which is the greatest. Is everyone, do you guys know what freedom is? Freedom is this app um, which blocks the internet and you can block it for a set period of time. And it is the greatest gift that I've ever given myself because it allows for that mental space that we just have been trained not to get anymore because of the, the dopamine hit of the internet. Um, and so it blocks my computer from the internet for say 45 minutes. Um, and I'll sit down on the 45 minute period in which I'm writing. Um, and then the 45 minutes will come up and it, either I'll keep going if I'm you know, on a roll or I'll stop and take a break and then I'll put it on again. Um, and it keeps me focused throughout the day. Um, one thing I do every day is I edit the pages from the day before. And so by the time I start writing, I don't even notice I'm starting to write. Like it's like, I, I trick myself because if you're editing, you're sort of already in the document and then you just kind of keep going. Um, it makes the transition to writing a little smoother because otherwise you sit down and you're like, what happens? I don't know. But if you go back and sort of smooth out, it makes things easier. And then it also makes your first draft a little stronger because it's all been edited as you've gone. Um, and then I come home at five, like, like clocking out. Um, and then I'm, you know, a boring mom <laughs> who makes dinner and puts my kids to bed and, you know, watches too much Netflix and reads some books. Um, it's not glamorous at all. It involves a lot of, um, elastic waisted pants. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I really don't wear clothing, like real clothing, except for when I'm on tour. Otherwise, I am literally in like an Old Navy battered tank top and sweatpants. Um, even though I go to an office, I, like I treat it like it's, you know, my bedroom. Um, and now that we're in a pandemic, I cannot go to my office anymore. Um, and I miss it so, so much. Um, I've now put a desk in my bedroom, and which has been great. It's nice to have a writing space at home, um, but my kids don't leave me alone. Like I don't get that sort of 
real physical space that I need. Like I need a room of one's own. Like I need that extra, you know, place where you can close the door and know no one's gonna bother you for a certain period of time. Um, so not much work is getting done now. Oops, sorry. Um, do you miss some of the community that you had when you would be in this writer space with other authors? Was it nice to bounce ideas off of them or just have people who knew what it was like? Yeah, I mean, I had a, I have some friends there um, who it was really nice. I mean, I have a bunch of writer friends who I talk to all the time. Um, we've been having like regular Zoom calls once a week just to catch up. Um, so I do feel like I get to have that anyway. Um, I mean, it's different not face to face. I, as I said before, I'm a huge introvert, so I, I actually don't find I'm missing that much, that part so much. What I'm missing truly is flow. Like, I feel like when you write without distraction, you get to tap into that part of yourself that like just escapes into what you're working on and the whole world falls away and you're just in your, in your own world working on this thing you're creating. Um, and now it's like, you know, I write a paragraph and then someone ask me where's lunch and then, you know, someone else needs to be wiped or something. I mean, it's, it's, there's really very little um, true running away in my brain, which is where all the fun is. Um, and so I find that's the thing I miss the most. Um, would you ever see like in the future, like making a movie out of one of your books? Because I know with some authors, they're so protective of their characters that they don't want them to be like distorted that they don't even consider it really i would love 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 to have my books made into a movie with my very first book the opposite of love it was optioned by anne hathaway um and she was attached to star in it and then it just never got made which happens all the time in hollywood it's sort of part of the you know the system here um it's i mean i have so little control over whether that actually happens getting mm -hmm. So tricky and difficult. Um, I am working on a pitch at the moment for Tell Me Three Things to be a film. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, I actually think out of all my books, that would be the, the one that is such a natural adaptation to film. Like it yeah. really does have a rom com beat for beat. Um, and so, and I, and I would like to write it. That's, that's the one that if I was going to, to, to adapt, I would want to adapt it myself. Um, hope and other punchlines, there's been some interest. I'd, I actually would, I want to have someone else do it. Like, I don't, I, I love that book. I feel protective over it. Um, but I also never want to touch it. It, it was so hard to delve into that material. I don't want to go back there. Um, but I think it's an important story and I would love for it to be told again in another way. Um, and I'd love to see what someone else would do with it, uh, but I don't want to do it. So it's, it's, it's depending on the project, I guess is the answer. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for everything to be made, <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah, because I read Eleanor in Park, but like, I know the author, she, there was like maybe one version of it, but she, it didn't like do justice to the characters. So she's like, ixnay it. Oh, really? Oh, that's what I read, but I'm not sure. But like, it's like, she's really, I know she's really protected, protective mm -hmm. of the characters, which is justifiable. Yeah, I totally get it. I mean, I think when you allow someone to make a movie of your work, um, you have to sort of accept that it's no longer yours, right? Like writing is a solitary process. You're alone in a room with your laptop. Um, yeah. And even my editor who gives me notes doesn't write anything, right? It, like it's still my name on the cover. A movie is a collaborative project. Um, and so when you sell your movie rights, you are saying you're going to be making art out of my art and your art is something different than my art. And I think I'm okay letting that happen. And I think it's just interesting to see what would happen. Even if they made a really crappy movie out of one of my books, yeah. it would be just an interesting thought experiment to see. It doesn't take away what, from what I have on the page. Yeah. Um, I guess if I wrote a crappy movie and, and, and felt like it was a bad adaptation, that would really stink. But yeah. if there's someone else making something from my art, I think that's super cool. Um, mm -hmm. Like my daughter has been lately reading some fan fiction on the internet. And I think it's such an interesting concept of people making art from other people's art. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of characters inspiring other writers to write. Um, and so a film, I mean, unless it did something offensive, right? Like, yeah. um, I don't know. I can't even think of what it would be, but like some, like, you know, made a caricature out of David, that would, that would be upsetting to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that would really be horrifying. But other than something offensive, I think it would be interesting. It's like a, 
an interesting, I don't know, gift from the universe. Yeah. Have you read um, Carry On, Rainbow Rose? I've not read Carry On yet, but I've read um, Fangirl, Eleanor and Park, and Attachments. Okay. Read yeah. Carry On. It's my favorite. I've read all of her stuff too. I yeah. love Carry On, and it's so not my type of thing. Um, I don't yeah. love magic or wizards or any of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I loved it. Like, it's so charming. Um, it's her at her best. I highly yeah. recommend it. Yeah, because I couldn't really get into Harry Potter, but I could get into the Hunger Games, though. I'm on the prequel right now, so. How is the prequel? The prequel's really cool because it's not that much of a spoiler, but it's like, um, it's through the perspective of President Snow, but this is when he was a kid. Oh, interesting. Living in the Capitol and how he's doing things now and how, and it's like post-war of the Dark Age, of the Dark Days. And uh, the Hunger Games taking place after that. Okay. And his, uh, his part playing in those, like, games. It's okay. really interesting. Just be like, oh, this kind of makes sense of what he did in the future. I'm kind of waiting. My daughter's still too young for Hunger Games, and so I'm waiting for her to start, and then I'll reread all of them and then read the prequel. Yeah. So it's, I have a few years before I can go to it. Yeah. I guess I could read it and then read it again, but... Yeah. yeah. It's... I would say that she um, updated the vocabulary in it because she, I think she expected her audience originally to now be older because oh, it has a more broad vo vocabulary in the writing. Oh, interesting. I mean, I think also she has a huge adult audience. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that when you're trying to find ideas for your next book, you often go through a bunch of movies or shows, museums, and other books. I wondered, what are some of the recent books that have really stuck out to you? Hmm, what have I read recently? To be honest, since the pandemic, um, I am exclusively reading romance, um, like real romance novels with happily ever after, um, because uh -huh. I need comfort. Like, I just need to know everything's going to be okay at the end. Like, I do not have it in me to be challenged right now. Um, before, though, let me think of some books that I've really loved. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. Um, Picture Us in the Light, Kelly Loy Gilbert, I think is her name. Um, do I have that right? I feel like I might not have it right, the name. Anyhow, Picture, in the, in, Picture Us in the Light is brilliant and beautiful um, and one of the best YA books I've read in years. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, anything by Nikki Yoon. You know, she's just a master. Um, I love her as a person, but she's also just a master writer. And reading her book is like reading a master class in how to pull things off. Um, I don't tend to reread all that much, um, especially in YA, because I don't want to accidentally absorb someone else's work. Um, but I will go back and like reread something if I think they did something particularly well and I want to see how they pulled it off. Um, like if I, if I was writing a mystery, I would go back and read One of Us is Lying and look at how she constructed that mystery, for example. I'm not writing a mystery, but if I were, um, I would do that. Um, i trying to think what else I've read recently that I've loved. I'm looking around my room as if I um, can see anything and I don't have anything around here. I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't be stumped by such an easy question. It's the easiest question of the day and I, you stump me, man. <laughs> have you read every last word? Every, is that uh um yes I have I really I read it a couple of years yeah. ago I really enjoyed it. The, I read it in like two days. Compulsive, obsessive compulsive disorder. A girl with obsessive. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Um, and you know what I'm gonna read next, which I've already read. Um, all the boys I loved before is next up because I yeah, just bought I want to read that. Um, I just haven't I, gotten to it yet. Yeah, I mean, I love the next Netflix movie, um, and because I'm interested in adapting Tell Me Three Things, I think it'll be interesting to reread the book and rewatch the movie, um, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to make my daughter do it with me and call it school in my mind, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, that works. <laughs> yeah. Anything to feel like it's, you know, they're not wasting their lives on the screen all day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Awesome. Sabrina, I wish I could get a kid to read. <laughs> Sabrina, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Any last ones? It looks like we have a couple minutes left. Um, do you, like, how long do you foresee, like, 
since like everything was going on, you being able to do a book tour for admissions? It's interesting. We haven't, so my book comes out in December and we have not scheduled a book tour in any way. Um, my impression is publishing has stopped travel through the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot will depend on, you know, your parents' research, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. When a vaccine happens, um, I was talking to a friend who organizes book festivals um, and she was asking about like comfort with travel in the spring. Um, and I was like, I don't, it's all a question of whether it's safe to fly, right? Like no matter what accommodations they make at an actual festival, um, I think my risk tolerance level is way lower than most people's. Um, mm -hmm. I am on the extreme end where like, I do not leave my house pretty much these days. Mm -hmm. If they're not allowed to leave the house without a mask, um, you have all our groceries delivered. Like I am really mm -hmm. staying at home and taking it as seriously as you can possibly take it. I spent two hours this morning wiping down my groceries. Um, and so I am going to be very hesitant to be hundred percent honest. I'll be very hesitant to go on book tour until I feel a hundred percent confident that, um, you know, it's safe. Yes. And like I, a part two of that question, would you like, not doing like a traditional route would you have, like ever consider doing some kind of like virtual like and then maybe do like you have a bunch of book signing and send them all out mm -hmm. and that's like through mail so that way people don't come in contact with other people and then you could do like a tour virtually in a yeah. sense i think all publishers right now are sort of rethinking how we do things mm -hmm. um and yes absolutely i've been doing actually a ton more virtual stuff lately as we all mm -hmm. have um I've been doing this thing on Instagram um, mm -hmm. called the Buck Stops Here. It's like my own cable access show every mm -hmm. day at um, 2, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays, not every day. Every Thursday, I interview a writer and we chat. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a chat pretty much just like this um, about mm -hmm. what they're working on and what I'm working on and how sort of how they're writing through this pandemic. Um, and I've been doing it more just for fun. Um, but it's been a really interesting way to, to talk to readers because they can ask questions while I'm chatting. Uh, yeah. And so, yes, my, I, I have not been some, I mean, I've always been on social media, but this has sort of been a new way of putting, I don't usually put my face on social media. Like I'm not usually doing the camera stuff. I'll, you know, use words cause that's my mode of communication. Yeah. Um, but, um, it's been different and I, I think virtual stuff is just going to have to become the norm. I don't like it as much. Like for example, this, I was gonna do a whole presentation with gifts mm -hmm. and all sorts of things, but it's not possible to do it in this format. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's possible, but you don't have the same sort of energy. You don't get to see mm -hmm. people's reaction. I mean, I think Zoom really does change the center of a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other, uh, on the flip side, you know, it does allow some more access for people who can't afford to buy a book. At least they can come and log mm -hmm. on and see you. Or people who are a different country um, or live too far away from bookstores, get access mm -hmm. now to hearing writers speak. Um, and I think that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it, I think the world, I, as with every industry, we're all sort of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so, so much for giving up a little bit of your afternoon to be with us today and chatting. It's been awesome to hear what it's actually like to be a writer and to know that you're not in an isolated cottage by the sea. <laughs> I so wish. That's, that sounds delightful. Doesn't it? I don't know where I got that from. Probably I love it. Like a little hole at the elbow. Uh, <laughs> exactly. A cup awesome. of tea at my, at my hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it, it does not look like that at all. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank it you. Was yeah, thank you. So, it was so nice to meet you. Yeah, it was well, wonderful. Luck with everything in the fall. Thank you. I'll be sending all my positive, uh, you know, admissions energy out to you. Thank you. Well, have a good Thank weekend, you. everyone. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.